So, hello everyone. My name is Juan Pablo Flores. I am a student from here, from the book. And I'm going to present the first chapter of the book that we are studying, the book from Legal. That is, uh, and the first chapter is called Gaussian Variables and Gaussian Processes. So, in this, in this first session, I'm going to present, well, some things that I hope that you know, some things about Gaussian variables, and other things that maybe you don't know. For example, I didn't knew about Gaussian vectors, Gaussian processes, Gaussian spaces, and things like that. Um, and the idea is that we build, uh, we build, uh, uh, well, we, we build our concepts in the hope to, to construct what the author calls the Gaussian white noise that is going to be needed to construct the Brownian motion in chapter two, I think. So let's begin. Uh, we are going to be working with a probability space, omega fp, and we recall that a Gaussian random variable with mean m and variance sigma square is a random variable that has this density function. Yes? Uh, it is well known that a Gaussian is, well, there, there are several statements that are equivalent to being Gaussian. The first is that there exists a, Gaussian, a standard Gaussian that, well, if we, we start with a Gaussian Y that has mean M, M and variance sigma squared, well, there exists also a Gaussian X, a standard Gaussian, that we can write Y as sigma X times the sigma X plus uh, the mean M. This is also equivalent to uh, having this characteristic function of this form. So, well, from here to here, it is only a computation, and from here to here, it's, um, it, it, and we need to use that the characteristic function characterizes what a Gaussian is. Or, uh, what a random value, what is the distribution of a random value. So in, in the book they seem interested also in the case where sigma squared is equal to zero. Yes. The <laughs> so uh, yeah, in the book we also admit that uh, when sigma is equal to zero, the Gaussian, uh, the random variable is also a, a Gaussian. So if we have that y has distribution, a, a Gaussian distribution with mean m and uh, variance zero, well, that is going to be a constant almost true. So yeah, um, well. Just an observation, if we have sigma equal to zero, well, we still have uh, this formula for the characteristic function. We need only to plug here sigma equal to zero. Uh, okay. Uh, Gaussian random variables have uh, some good properties. Uh, for example, if we have two Gaussians that are independent from each other, we have the, that the sum is also going to be a Gaussian. And in fact, the, the distribution of this sum is going to have a mean equal to the sum of the means and variance equal to the sum of the variance. Uh, also, other good property of Gaussians is that, well, if we have a sequence of Gaussians, not necessarily independent from each other, we have a sequence and we know that this sequence converges, converges, uh, converges to some random variable x in the L2 sense, then we can conclude that this random variable that we know by hypothesis that it exists, it's also going to be a Gaussian. And well, uh, the mean is going to be the limit of, of the means and the variance is going to be the limit of the variances. In, in particular, this results tell us that, well, if we have this uh, sequence of, of Gaussian random variables that converges in L2, then the means and the variances also converge. Uh, well, and this result also holds for all uh, spaces LP, distinct than infinity. Okay, so 
Gaussians have these good, <laughs> this good properties. Sum of independent Gaussians are Gaussians. Limits of Gaussians are also Gaussians. And maybe here, uh, yes, here we can um, observe why we need that uh, admit that sigma equal to zero is also a Gaussian because this can be converted to a constant. So we need to say that that is a uh, Gaussian also. Okay. So let's move on now to Gaussian vectors and the properties of the Gaussian vectors. We are going to be working with an, a vector space E that is going to be d d dimensional, And we are going to have an inner product in this uh, vector space. We are going to define a Gaussian vector as, well, a random variable that is taking values in the vector space E. Uh, that such that if we make the inner product of x with any vector u, we are going to have a Gaussian random variable. Um, yes. And as an example, well, we can take a e equal to rd. And well, all the d dimensional vector spaces are essentially rd. Um, and we are going to have, uh, well, the uh, uh, independent Gaussians. So the claim is that x equal to uh, well, this vector is going to be Gaussian when we are taking the, the inner product equal to the dot product. Um, and well, so let u be equal to u1 to ud. Well, the uh, dot product between u and x is going to be u1, x1, ud, xd. Well, since we are assuming that x1 to xd are independent, well, each, each sum of all, uh, uh, the, the sums of all of these are going to still be Gaussian by the I think that the first property that we saw. So essentially, a Gaussian vector is, well, a vector that when you make linear combinations between its coordinates, it's still Gaussian. Yes. That's uh, morally that 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 is what it is. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. A proposition. Uh, let x be a Gaussian vector now, taking values in this vector space E. Uh, well, we can ask, uh, ask ourselves uh, what is the mean and what is the variance of these random uh, variables that we are generating with this random vector. Yes? So this proposition tells us that, well, there exists a, a vector in E such that the expected value of this random variable is going to be, well, the same u uh, inner product with this vector. Uh, well, and the variance of this random variable is going to be a quadratic form that is the same for all the vectors evaluated in u. So, well, if we, if we, well, this means that, well, the, the inner product of u with x is going to have well, normal uh, the Gaussian uh, random variable with mean this and variance that. Uh, okay. And also a corollary, well, the, the characteristic function of this, of this Gaussian is going to have this form because of replacing, replacing things. Uh, uh, well, this proof is uh, a lot of, I think that almost all is linear algebra. Uh, so um, and the, the, in fact, a lot of these proofs are going to be linear algebra. So I'm going to prove this and the rest is, it's the same idea. Yes. So, Okay, 
So we have a um, d-dimensional vector space E, and we are going to take an orthonormal basis of this vector space. We expect that this mx is going to be is well the following. We are going to define xj equal to the inner product of ej that is one of the elements of our basis mm -hmm. with x and well mx is going to be the coordinates in this in this basis of these expected values. also write a vector u in terms of this basis so we also have this and if we take the inner product between u and xj U and X, sorry, sorry. Uh, this is going to be well. In an orthonormal basis, the inner product is just the dot product. So this is going to be. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's going to be uh, times uh, ej x. Yes. So if we now take um, the expectations, and I am going to move this line, expectation of this. Uh, this is going to be um, well this is not random so this is a constant mm -hmm. and the expectation of this that is a Gaussian random particle but this is exactly um, xj. So this is the expectation of xj. So we can see that the expectation is going to be seen as some kind of inner product between uh, u and the mx because that is going to be the that kind that that it's like a dot product. Yes, a coordinate by coordinate. So yeah, this proves that uh, the expectation of this is the inner product between u and mx. So uh, is there any question? as the inner product between each element of this orthonormal basis with x, we are going to have that x1 to xd are all independent if and only if the covariance matrix here is diagonal. So um, usually, in fact, for all for all random variables, if we are if we have independent random variables, then the covariance matrix must be diagonal. It, it says that they are uncorrelated. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. So we have the another the, the other implication that if the random variables are uncorrelated, then in fact they are independent, and they they use the additional fact that well, the vector must be Gaussian. All uh, linear combinations of its coordinates must be Gaussian. Um, yes. So well, the proof, the 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 implication from left to right is pretty pretty obvious, and the implication from right to left, well, you you must use the this fact about uh, characteristic functions, and if you do the computations, it uh, it it holds the result. So I'm going to skip that. Uh, yeah. Okay. So. Another fact about these Gaussian vectors is well, we have a quadratic form that is it is used to define the uh, it is used to compute the variance of this inner product, and of course to this quadratic form you can associate a self-adjoint endomorphism, no. asymmetric matrix, yes, and well, since this this endomorphism is self-adjoint. In fact, must be must must have all its um, eigenvalues non-negative because it, it is a variance. Uh, being self-adjoint, this endomorphism, we can always pick an orthonormal basis of the vector space that also are all eigenvectors of the endomorphism. For the same reason, uh, and by the previous proposition, since the covariance matrix represented in these eigenvectors, in the uh, I mean in these spaces, is going to be diagonal. Uh, we can, if we start with a random uh, with a Gaussian vector x, we always can generate the uh, random variables that are all independent from each other. Okay. Uh, any any question? Any questions with that? Mm, no. Wait. Okay. So, final result about Gaussian vectors before we move to um, Gaussian processes. Um, okay. So, uh, we are going to have here a center Gaussian vector, but that is its mean is going to be zero. Um, uh, it's mean maybe defined in, in this way in the blackboard. So we are going to take an orthonormal basis of E consisting of eigenvectors of the endomorphism associated with the Gaussian vector. And we are going to call lambda j to its uh, eigenvalues. And we are going to pick these eigenvalues in a decreasing order, uh, taking a, a yeah. So ah, here's a typo. Lambda one. Lambda one. Yes. Uh, so lambda r is going to be the last eigenvalue that is, uh, is a positive. Uh, from from lambda lambda r plus one to lambda d are going to be all zero. So r is going to be the the rank, of the endomorphism. So the first <coughs> statement is that well x can be can be written in this way. Instead of uh, summing to d, we can sum to d. That is pretty pretty obvious, since all the other eigenvalues is going are going to be zero. Okay. The second statement is that well, uh, the topological support of the distribution of x is going to be in the span of these of these first r vectors. Yeah, it, it makes it makes sense the, because of the previous statement. Yes. Uh, the third is that well, the distribution is going to be absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure, if and only if R here, the rank, is equal to D. That is, it has full rank. That is because if R is less than D, then well. The images of, uh, I mean, the, the, the support of this random variable is living in some, well, maybe in a hyperplane or something like that, and the Lebesgue measure of these spaces is going to be zero. 
and well, if r is equal to d, then one can find a density. And for that reason, it's absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure. And well, I think that the most difficult part of this is the last one, but this is a computation. So yeah, it's only, <laughs> it's only compute things. So I'm going to ask again, any questions before we move to Gaussian processes, Gaussian spaces? You use characteristic functions for four, or for this? Yeah. Uh, no, no. It, it is not necessary. Um, what? What? I forgot now. How was that? Uh, uh, blah, 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 blah. Ah, you need you need to use. Uh, you use or you compute the marginals, uh, like the xj density, and then you use independence. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. And then and I sum it from e from from Rd. Okay. And use the, yeah, that is all. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's move now to Gaussian processes and Gaussian spaces. In a way, Gaussian processes are going to generalize these Gaussian vectors. We are going to be take, uh, be, we are going to take uh, infinite, maybe, of these uh, random variables. So, first definition, uh, we're going to define a Gaussian space as a closed vector subspace of L2 over this probability triplet uh, that only contains center Gaussian random variables. So from now on, all Gaussians are going to be centered. Yes? From now on to the end of the presentation, all Gaussians centered. Um, and one may ask it oneself about this about this closeness, <laughs> about this this condition of being a closed vector space. So one may ask oneself, if I have a subvector space of L2, that only contains a Gaussian random variables. Yes? One may ask oneself, well, it is true that the closure of that subspace also contains only Gaussian random variables? And the answer, well, the answer is there. The answer is yes, because if you take limits of Gaussian random variables, you still have a Gaussian random variable. So the closure always have um, Gaussian, only Gaussian random variables. So, you can start with a, with a space uh, that only contains Gaussians and then take closure to obtain the Gaussian space. There is You're no using the first proposition there, right? Uh, and that of the limits? Yeah. Yes, yes, that was the first proposition, yes. But you're using it in a, like, you will be taking limits of Gaussian random variables, which are limits of this space, right? Yeah, limits in, uh, in the L2 sense. In L2, mm -hmm. yes. so you can use the proposition. Yes, right. yes, yes. And so they're all centered. Uh, yes. Because mm -hmm. every M is zero. Yes, yes. Ah, also, other observation, uh, not an observation, but from now on, we are only working with L2. Yeah. Um, uh, is there any question? Uh. Okay, so an example of a Gaussian of a Gaussian space is, well, I start with a Gaussian, a Gaussian vector in, it is visible from here, <laughs> and here it is visible. Yeah. So start with a Gaussian, yeah, Gaussian vector. This Gaussian vector is going to be living in RD. So uh, the span of the coordinates of this Gaussian vector is going to be a Gaussian space. Why? Well, since uh, 
by definition of Gaussian vector, all linear combinations of these coordinates are Gaussians, then, well, the span only contain Gaussians. The, th the second thing is that, well, this is, a, a, its dimension is finite, so it must be a closed subspace of L2. So this is, well, all the elements here are Gaussians, it is a closed subspace, then must be a Gaussian space. Uh, okay. Now, uh, let's define what is a random process, a quick definition. So we are going to uh, take a measurable space, E with a sigma algebra uh, calligraphy P, an arbitrary index set that usually is, well, the natural numbers of the real line. And we can use T to, to uh, codify time. So T can be thought as time. Uh, a random process then, indexed by T, uh, and taking values in this measurable space, uh, is a collection of random variables taking values on the measurable space. So, uh, uh, yes, and when this tuple is not specified, well, we assume that E is the real line, and the sigma algebra is the Borel sigma algebra. From now on, B calligraphic is going to be always put a signal. Uh, yes. So what is a Gaussian process? Well, a Gaussian process is going to be a random process that, um, well, all the elements of this process are Gaussians and all linear combinations of the elements are also going to be Gaussian. In fact, center Gaussians because, because we are working only with center Gaussians. So we are asking that the random process is centered itself, just the, the linear combinations must be centered. I mean, but doesn't that imply that? Uh, it, yes, it is implied because if you if you take only one element, then it is a linear combination of all the other elements, uh, taking weights equal to zero set in one element. But if you have uh, maybe a, a mean one and a mean minus one, when you sum the two Gaussians. It's zero, right? Yeah, but taking linear combinations of one element is still allowed. Right? Yeah. Oh, okay. You can take like a single term. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, well, a Gaussian process is like a generalization of a Gaussian vector only with infinite elements. Uh, yeah. And here a proposition. If we have a Gaussian process, and we take first the span of this Gaussian process. Well, the span is going to be all Gaussians by definition of Gaussian process. And then if you take closure by what I told here, uh, this subspace also going to be only Gaussians. And it's going to be closed because you are taking closure. So this subspace is going to be a Gaussian space. And we are going to call that space the Gaussian space generated by the process. Okay, uh, first theorem, uh, yes. This, this theorem is relating uh, this, well, we're, work, we're working in L2. L2 is a Hilbert space, it has a Hilbert structure. So we can ask ourselves, ourselves um, is there any relationship between the independence and this Hilbert structure that is the orthogonality in the space? And the answer is yes. If we start with a with a parent Gaussian space that is going to be center, always center, and we take a collection of subspaces of H, then the subspaces are going to be orthogonal in L2, in the L2 sense, if and only if the sigma algebras generated by these subspaces are independent. In a way, this is a generalization of this of this other fact that uh, when you take Gaussian vectors, then um, independence, and, uh, independence is equivalent to uncorrelated. Yes, yes, independence is equivalent to uncorrelatedness. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, or a diagonal covariance matrix. Yes, yes. So uh, yeah, uh, that's it. The first remark is maybe important to note.
So in this theorem, we start with a Gaussian uh, space that is like a parent space. We have H here. And all the HI, and I don't know, HI1, HI2, uh, are subspaces of H. They are all contained in H. So for this to be true, you need that the elements of this HI, when you sum them, it is also a Gaussian. That is, that is codified by this fact to be to all this H I B in H. And in fact, there is a, uh, an example of why that is needed. You can start with a standard Gaussian. And take also a, a, a Radamacher random variable, parameter one half. And you can, you must assume that X and R are independent. So X independent from R. You define X1 equal to X and x2 equal to r times x. Well, x1, it's obvious a Gaussian because, yes, nothing to discuss there. And x2 is also going to be a Gaussian by the fact that it's symmetric, yes? You can also prove that with law of total probabilities with respect to the Radamacher random variable. It's not difficult. Um, then, well, both are Gaussians, and if you take the inner product in L2 of x1 and x2, well, the inner product is the expected value of the product. And this is going to be, by replacing x1 and x2, it's going to be r times times x squared. Um, then by independence, well, you can split this. <laughs> and we know that the expected value of the Radamacher is going to be zero. So this is so x1 and x2 are orthogonal between each other. And well, it is obvious that x1 and x2 are not independent, yes? Because they are defined through the same x, yes? So yes, you need this hypothesis here from of starting with uh, some kind of parent uh, Gaussian space. Uh, OK, any questions with that, uh, about that? If, if you try to do this, this with this example, what fails? Because uh, well, x1 and x2 are Gaussians, right? But x1 plus x2 are not Gaussians. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I <laughs> forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. That is the problem. And I'm not, I'm not going to give, well, one side of the proof is, is obvious. Uh, independence implies orthogonality. Uh, but the other side, well, it is not difficult, but es la pena. Es la uh, the other side, you need to well think about uh, what is the meaning uh, of taking uh, what is the meaning of a collection of sets to be independent, and the well the definition of that is that if you take a finite subcollection, you mean uh, that finite subcollection is independent. And then you need to ask yourself what is the meaning that a finite subcollection of sigma algebras to be independent. Well, there is a theorem to prove that. Um, I think that is the monotone convergence theorem. That if you, yeah, you can prove it to a smaller families and then that that has some some property and then pass to the infinity to a sigma algebra. Uh, but it, it it goes through taking expectations of functions of f of, of x and y, or not? In fact, in the proof that is in the book, uh, 
or you're just looking at the probabilities of events? No, uh, the, the proof that is in the book is that, well, yeah, you take first a finite sub collection, mm -hmm. and then to prove that uh, the finite sub, sub collection is independent, you need to pick elements, finite elements from each of the of the sigma algebras you pick. Yes. Yeah. And well, then it says that well, each of these uh, is going to generate a Gaussian space. I can take an orthonormal basis uh -huh. there, okay. and well, there then they plug all the <laughs> all the random yeah. models together and say, well, the uh, when I know that if the I have a Gaussian vector and the covariance have diagonal form, then it's independent. So yeah. So you so diagonalize a bunch of Gaussian yes. uh, vectors, each of them on these subspaces. Yeah, and then okay. go backwards to conclude that yes, all the sigma algebras, the families, hmm. is uh, independent. So yes, it is long and a bit tedious. So okay. <laughs> if you want to, <laughs> to know about it, I recommend to read the the proof. Uh, so a corollary from this from this equivalence between uh, orthogonality and independence is the following. Well, if we start again with a parent Gaussian space center, and we take a closed subspace K from this H, and we denote by pi sub K the orthogonal projection onto K, uh, orthogonal projection in the, well, L2 is Hilbert, so we can define that, that is well defined, uh, and one, and take X in the parent space H, then the conditional expectation of X given sigma K, the sigma algebra generated by K, is going to be the orthogonal projection. And um, yeah, when we are working in the L2 framework of probability, that is, there is a known fact that, that that happens, but that happens with another space. So in the general framework of probability, we have that uh, the conditional expectation of X given sigma K is, the, is also the orthogonal projection, but with, with respect to this space. And this space is bigger. Huh? That's defined like that. Yeah. yeah. And this in L2. Yeah. Yes. So since the, the, this k is smaller, then this is this is better. In the Gaussian framework, this is better. And also, the other statement is that, well, if we define sigma squared like this, like the L2 distance, L2 squared distance of x to its projection, then we are going to have a formula for the conditional probability of x. And it's going to have this formula. So if sigma is greater, greater than zero, zero uh, we are going to have a Gaussian here. And if it's, if it, it's zero, then we have this indicator function. Um, is there any quest question about this currently? The first part is that the, we're projecting the expected, the conditional expectancy is projecting into a smaller space rather than the other general part. Yes. Okay. Yes. And the second is, uh, well, the, there is a formula for this. Okay. I mean, one, one is already telling you that the conditional expectation of X is a Gaussian. Or the con of sorts? <laughs> <laughs> or is it? It's not? It, I mean the... What is it then? I mean, one is telling you that because K is a K closed is a subspace. Close subspace, so it's a so Gaussian. It Gaussian. Mm -hmm. the K, K is formed by Gaussian, at least. Yes. Then you're projecting, yeah, the projection yeah. is a Gaussian, that's what I'm saying. K about like a compact set. No, no, right, no. right. <laughs> okay, okay. I mean, that, that like, chooses more, right? That you'd say it's giving you a density function yeah. as well. But, uh, cool. and that density has the Gaussian shape. Yes. Uh, except for the singular case, where the, basically, the I guess, space. Yes. what happens in the second case, I guess, is like the density is collapsing because the variance is zero, right? Like yes. But it is saying in the projection language that, that x is equal to the projection. You are, you are already on this, this, this set. 
Sigma is equal to zero. Yes. Yeah. X is saying equal to zero. that essentially these two variables. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. This guy was already in the subspace. Already okay. You're already in the subspace, yeah. right? So, well, uh, a little proof about this. Uh, I asked. A proof is So we have our random variable here, x, and we have a subspace uh, k. Uh, subspace k. So we are projecting, projecting onto k. Yes? So we project here, and we have the projection. And with that projection, we define, well, the random variable y. Mm -hmm. So y is going to be this, this arrow. So from the picture, it is, I think that it is clear that, well, y is going to be orthogonal to all the space k. And well, by the previous theorem, since we are working with a with a parent space, orthogonality it is equivalent to independence. So, uh, well, y is going to be independent from all the well, from the sigma algebra of k. Well, then we can we can write this conditional expectation. Uh, we can write x as well y plus the projection that is on the algebra. Uh, we use the linearity of the conditional expectation. Then we use that, well, y is independent from sigma k, so the best way to estimate this conditional expectation is by the mean of y, and y has mean zero, so this goes. And, well, the projection is sigma k measurable. So we can, well, this is equal almost truly to uh, to the projection of k, uh, of x onto k. So that is the proof. Very, very simple. Uh, for the other proof, we need to. Uh, yeah. For the other proof, um, we need to use this lemma here that treats <laughs> that tell us how to uh, compute the conditional expectation of a function that their inputs are two independent random variables. And one of them is measurable with respect to the sigma algebra. So we start with a probability space. We have a sub-sigma algebra, G of F. Uh, we have that C is a G measurable uh, random variable. So C is G measurable. Y uh, is independent of this, random, this uh, sigma algebra. And we are going to have that, well, if G is also a measurable, a model measurable, measurable a non-negative function, then this, ex this conditional expectation can be written in this way, as an integral of Y. Um, yes. So, yeah, we are going to use this lemma. And sorry, I didn't knew how to put poses <laughs> into an um, <laughs> equation. So, I'm going to be. I'm going to uh, explain line by line. So we fix an omega in the uh, sample space and a uh, Borel set. So, by definition, the conditional expectation is going to be the. Con I mean, the conditional probability is going to be the conditional expectation of this indicator function. Now, same trick as before. We can write x as the projection times y. Yes. Uh, now, since this indicator function is a non-negative measurable function, we can use the lemma from before 
and we can write this conditional expectation as this. Uh, we can use now that, well, this y, that is that arrow, is also a, a Gaussian. In fact, it is a center Gaussian because it is living in a, in a Gaussian space, a center Gaussian space. It's a center Gaussian. And its mean is going to be, well, its mean is going to be uh, y, uh, the expectation of y squared, but y is equal to um, x minus 3x. And we have a quantity for this by hypothesis. We call this a uh, sigma square. So y is going to be a, ga a center Gaussian with variance sigma square, given by the hypothesis. So we have a density for this distribution, that is that. And well, we can use this uh, property of, tra of translation and write this here. Hmm. And this recovers one part of the proof, the case c my equal to zero is easier. It is x is equal to its projection. So yeah. Uh, questions about this proof? Okay. That, that fact about integration and do you cover it in measure theory or uh, I don't no. think so. <laughs> anybody? No, I'm not sure to, uh, I mean, that's an exercise. <laughs> 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 I thought that this curve had never <laughs> used that. No, no, I remember they uh, asked us to prove it. Like, it was one of the exercises when we covered yeah. conditional expectations. Yeah, it's a good exercise. Yeah. So, the last topic of this presentation, I mean, I think that I can, I can call it. Uh, um, it is, well, the the result, and I mean the, the concept that we want to define, that is Gaussian white noise. So we are going to have a measurable space E with a calligraphic E sigma algebra, algebra and take a sigma finite measure mu. So this, this is saying that we can cover E by, we can cover E by uh, sets of finite measure, that is uh, sigma finite. Okay, so a Gaussian white noise with intensity mu is, is um, well, the book says an isometry, and I think that uh, for me, not all isometries are linear, but I think that it means a linear isometry from G, uh, I mean, from L2 with this first um, measurable space with this measure to a center Gaussian space. Yes. In, in Hilbert spaces, I think it's true that every isometry is linear. Every isometry is linear? Yeah. Yes. I, I don't I, I, in fact, by the, the, construction, the construction that it makes, it is clear. But it is, it is linear. linear. It is linear in this case. Yeah. Okay. So one of the cases that we are going to be interested in, uh, uh, this, this case is the case we are going to use to construct a uh, Brownian motion is when E is equal to the real line. Calligraphic E is the uh, Borel sigma algebra. And mu, mu is the Lebesgue measure. OK, so a quick proposition about this, about this uh, Gaussian white noise. Well, if we start with two functions in L2, F and J, and if we have a Gaussian white noise with intensity mu, then well, g of f is going to be uh, is going to distribute a Gaussian that is by definition, and it's going to be centered also by definition, <laughs> and its variance is going to be the integral with respect to mu of f square, and that is by the isometry property. Um, So, um, yes, we are having, we need to compute this, uh, but this is the L2 norm uh, in one sense, uh, the L2 norm squared in one sense, 
uh, by the fact that G is an isometry, this is equal to the L2 norm in the other space. Um, well, this is the integral of F squared. So, yeah. The second statement is that, well, if we have, uh, is that the covariance of G of F and G of G is going to be given by the, the integral of this product. This is also a consequence of this isometry property. Uh, it preserves angles, so yeah. And this is, that is not going to be true. Uh, okay. Another instances of Gaussian white noise are the following. Uh, if we start con with, with f equal to an indicator function of a set A that has finite measure mu, then we are going to have that, well, we are going to define g of A equal to g of the indicator. And this, this is going to be a Gaussian, a center Gaussian, and it's going to have variance mu of A. And it's that problem. Yes, the same problem. Uh, okay, uh, I find this a cool property. The, if we have uh, a disjoint sequence of set of measurable sets, uh, all with finite measure, then this vector from here is going to be a Gaussian vector. That is, the linear combination of all its coordinates is going to be Gaussian because, well, G is linear. That is the reason is going to be a Gaussian vector. And also, these are going to be all independent. So uh, mm -hmm. the Gaussian ga white noise takes these joint sets to independent Gaussian random variables. And finally, if we can, well, decompose uh, a set A of finite measure into a disjoint union of other measurable sets, mm -hmm. well, First, we have that the indicator function can be seen as this limit, as, as this series that converges in L2. And this also implies that we can see G of A also as a series yeah, that converges in L2. And the important result here, uh, the existence of a Gaussian white noise. That is not obvious, I think. Um, so from now on, we are assuming that L2, this L2 space, the first, is a separable space. The result also holds when it is not separable, but it is not necessary. So, well, we have this symmetrical space with sin sigma finite measure mu. The claim is that there exists some appropriate probability space, omega fp, such that, well, we can, there exists a Gaussian white noise with intensity mu that is uh, mm. taking values there. And I think that in this case, in the measure, in the separable uh, case, uh, this space that we prove that there exists must, uh, the, I mean, can be uh, omega equal to the interval zero one, f the Borelian of this interval, and p the Lebesgue measure. So the proof of this existence result is the following. We are going to take an orthonormal base of L2, uh, a countable orthonormal base. This, this is possible because we are assuming this is separable. And then, well, given an, a function f in L2, we can write it in this way. And well, each alpha j, if each weight, is going to be a uh, inner product between f and the element of the orthonormal base. Uh, yeah, and also the alpha j's uh, have this property that the sum of its squares is going to be the measure. The, I, I mean the the L two norm square that is going to be finite. Okay, that is the. On an appropriate probability space, we can construct a sequence of IID Gauss, standard Gaussians. Uh, one always assumes that, but well, in an appropriate mm. probability space, one can make the construction explicitly. And as I said, uh, I think that you can take this as the interval zero one with the Lebesgue measure. 
and then set well d of f is going to be uh, the same thing as before but replacing the fj's with the xj's that are independent captions so first uh, this, seri this series converge in l2 because well these xj's are an orthonormal system we have this uh, well independence impl implies orthogonality and yes they are a standard gaussian so there is no problem there uh, second, this is well defined because these weights here are unique, so it is well defined. It is linear, so there is no problem with that. It's an isometry because uh, it takes orthonormal bases to orthonormal systems mm. and takes values in a Gaussian space. That is the Gaussian space generated by this process. Therefore, G is a Gaussian white noise. So there exists a Gaussian white noise. Um, yeah, I think that we are in time. There is only one proposition left that I think that we can leave it left the presentation here. Okay, so but the last one will like I we'll cover it next week or or is I it important? I don't know that okay. if it is important. Well, I, I can read the statement. The, the proof is pretty simple. So the statement is, uh, if you have a set of finite measure, and uh, you can divide this set by sequences, by these joint sequences, and each, well, you can have different <laughs> different sequences of of like refinements uh, yeah. refinements of mm -hmm. this of this division here and if you have that well all the cells go to zero that is quantified in this limit of the oh, screen okay. it's going to zero then you can recover the measure of the whole set by this this uh, limit here in the okay. sense. and the, the proof is is simple but <laughs> yeah. i think that we can definitely Maybe it's not even clear at this point what is, why is this useful, yeah, so we I, can... Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, uh, Juan Pablo. Thanks. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>